Back in college, I only took one psychology class. And the only reason I did is because all my friends couldn't stop raving about the professor who taught it. And they were telling me I had to take a class with this guy before I graduate. So I did, but I was pretty underwhelmed. A lot of the class seemed more like the professor's subjective observations rather than hard science. But he did say one thing that sticks with me to this day. He said the last faculty the human brain develops is the ability to perceive a situation from the perspective of another. And for some people, he said, that faculty never even develops at all. And I don't know if that's scientifically true or not, but it does seem consistent with my observation of the world. The smartest people I know have a clear ability to consider ideas from all angles, to consider a concept from all perspectives, and allow those perspectives to compete within their heads, choosing the strongest through that competitive process. These people generally have strong perspectives because they consider all perspectives. And so their worldview is generally well-reasoned and well thought out. Conversely, I know plenty of people who either can't or won't do that. People who seem to be able to consider a situation like a child only from their own perspective. And as a consequence, their perspectives are often weaker or at least less well-reasoned. Now, whether or not my professor was right when he said that crucial ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes is the last faculty of the human mind to develop, there's no doubt that such an ability has intellectual and moral value. It's a characteristic of an open mind, and it's a characteristic of a person with genuine concern for other people. It's an ability we should try to cultivate in our children, both at home and in the classroom. And that's exactly what I bet teachers in Tracy, California were trying to do when they gave students an essay assignment earlier this month. Academic decathlon students were preparing for an upcoming debate. Assigned to write opposing viewpoints on a topic, this according to the school district's director of student services. And one student chose a particularly controversial topic on which to write competing perspectives, white supremacism. And on the pro side, according to this report, the student didn't hesitate from making a bold case with applicable terminology. Here are a few quotes from that paper. Negroes have been both inferior to other races and incapable of civilization. We must cleanse the West from these inadequate leeches. And the N-word strives to destroy all that is sacred to humanity. Now, predictably, this essay caused some controversy among peer students, but perhaps less predictably, it actually prompted investigation from the FBI and local police. That investigation determined there was no threat, however, because as inflammatory as that first essay may seem on a surface level, the student also wrote an impassioned essay from the competing anti-racist perspective. Lieutenant Tony Sheneman says detectives interviewed the student who wrote the paper on Friday. They determined there was no threat to other students. He says that was clear to them once they read that other opposing viewpoint that he wrote. Here are a few quotes from that other paper. The youth of our nation are being contaminated by the filth that racism holds. I greatly urge you all to stand up against the prejudice shown and fight against this despicable bigotry. That's a topic of controversy, granted. Maybe even a topic of such controversy, the school may ask the student to write on a different topic, something less inflammatory. And it appears either out of direction from the school or out of courtesy to his peers, that's exactly what this student did, deleting his original work and opting instead to write about net neutrality. But how does this incident become a police matter? How does this situation consume police resources? Was this kid really investigated for wrong think? Not quite. He was investigated because his essay was perceived to be a genuine threat. One of the student's peers leaked the essay to his or her cousin, who posted the essay in full to Twitter, characterizing it as an anti-black white supremacist manifesto that was sent to several black students. That tweet is now deleted, but record of it remains via Google search data. Apparently, the FBI monitors Twitter for threats, prompting their investigation and notification to local police. That tweet prompted a law enforcement investigation. We were notified by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, who is monitoring Twitter feeds, apparently. But there are a couple of significantly ironic ironic things about this Twitter post that prompted the investigation. First, the irony that the owner of this Twitter account, who goes by the name Azaria, she's some sort of poet and racial activist who can be seen on a few media platforms, this one on Fusion, wearing a shirt proclaiming herself drenched in melanin. Her Twitter handle and website itself is under the name Melanin Elevatin. The irony that she would accuse a kid of writing a racist manifesto 
when writing racist manifestos is basically her MO. Consider this thread on her Twitter account. Quick food for thought, there are over 4 billion African or African descendants in the world. There are less than 1 billion Europeans or Krakas in the world. Why is there global consensus among our people to let a minority population control and run us? Y'all are wild if you think a cracka is gonna dictate how I move and live my life. If y'all truly wanted global liberation, we could have it, but y'all are too busy spoon feeding these crackas egos. I'm not saying eradicate the saltines, but all things white tend to be unhealthy. White rice, sugar, salt, mayo, people, bread, etc. Noted, when the apocalypse hits, only cannibalize people of color. The whites will go straight to your thighs. Most white foods tend to be bleached, stripping it of all nutrients, just like white people strip others of their culture. No coincidence, we should cut all things white out of our lives. That's all I'm saying. Now that's a racist manifesto if I've ever seen one. So I went ahead and tipped off the FBI to that one too in the hope that they investigate. No word yet on any follow-up. But here's the real kicker. When she made this post outing this kid, saying he's threatening black students, calling for his expulsion, and for others to call the school advocating the same thing, she actually doxed him too. And this kid isn't even white. The young gentleman that wrote this is not Caucasian. He's actually an Indian exchange student which she acknowledges in her doxing. But despite the fact that this kid is in fact a person of color himself, despite the fact that what he wrote is obviously an intellectual exercise and not advocacy, despite the fact that this Azaria person knows both of these things and that there's no plausible way to interpret what he wrote as a genuine racist manifesto, let alone some type of credible threat, she says none of that context matters. Azaria says she has now read both sides of that paper, that it makes no difference to her. She says he obviously felt comfortable using racial slurs and then tried to brush them off. There are far better ways, she says, to write about racism without making black students feel unsafe, that both the student and the school need to be held accountable. Yeah, but Azaria, you write using racial slurs on vaguely threatening terms in a completely sincere context, why don't you need to be held accountable? But beyond that, your dumb tweets aside, why should you decide what's appropriate school discipline for a district you don't attend 60 miles away from you. Why is that your venue? Speaking of discipline, the school district is not commenting on whether disciplinary action will be taken, by which I presume they mean the essay writer. But I hope, admittedly naively, that the disciplinary action they're considering taking is against the student who leaked this kid's writing to the public with the intent of bullying him. Of the two crimes in play here, one is thought crime. One is a juvenile guilty of merely entertaining the wrong thoughts for the purpose of intellectual exercise. The other is violating student privacy with the purpose of bullying him and his school into possible expulsion, altering a kid's life just for thinking the wrong things. This whole episode is a demonstration in exactly what my psychology professor was talking about. People who can consider the perspectives of others and people who can't. We have a kid who's entertaining competing thoughts in his head, honing his ability to consider differing perspectives intellectually, and when confronted with others' perspectives about how he may have crossed a line, did the courteous thing and opted to write new pieces on a new topic. And on the other side, we have this tweet activist who not only can't consider the context that explains this student's behavior, but explicitly says that context doesn't matter. Bizarrely, if I got to challenge her on her own racist manifesto, I suspect she would then suggest to me that context does matter in that case. But that's not sound reasoning. That's just whatever I say goes because I'm me and I'm awesome. Well, if you say so. But if you ever see this video, Azaria, get in touch with me. I'll give you a referral for a psychology professor who may be able to help you out. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel always. Appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter, that is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to come hang out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Okay.